Money makes you happy. Money matters. A Turkish boy wrote, I want to establish my own work and get very, very rich to own all the things I want to have. Another Turkish youth wrote, my ideal is to be rich in the future. Most relevant for a psychologist, material possessions was constructed as such as an important goal for some that the possibility of living happily with material possessions were not questioned. This discourse, accordingly, constitutes the individual as a subject who is not only motivated, but also obliged to earn a lot of money to escape a failed and happy life. In other words, positive future is dependent on money making. As a Turkish girl wrote, in spite of those who claim that money does not make you happy, I want a job who pays a lot. And a Norwegian boy claimed, well, anybody's dream is to get rich and happy. And I am not going to hide that this is mainly my dream. While this Turkish girl clearly is aware of a non-materialistic discourse of happiness, she positions herself against it. And this Norwegian boy makes a link between getting rich and being happy. Moreover, through the expression, it's anybody's dream, the boy takes for granted that it is normal to wish to become rich. Let it be mentioned uh, that the dominant ideological discourse in society does not necessarily need to be explicit all the times. Often the, we take them for granted. But for those who explicitly drew upon a materialistic discourse, their future well-being seemed to be conditioned by a need not primarily to obtain money for survival, <laughs> living and security, but to become rich and gain the material possessions to become happy. And most important in the material, there were in our material only few essays that challenged this idea, ideology of materialism. But one of them said, I have no expectations of becoming rich. Money is false happiness. Let it also be mentioned, analysis of the essays reveal differences in how use from the two societies relate to today's insecurity about future. An uncertain future with a limited potential for stable employment leads to a more worried self in Turkey, greatly affecting the well-being of the Turkish youth. Meanwhile, Norwegian youth seem to be at ease regarding their hopes and expectations for the future. The fact that in unemployment is not a major issue in the Norwegian society today, combined with the knowledge of social security policies, presumably led the Norwegian youth to worry less about their future in terms of material safety. The security provided by the welfare state seemed to be taken for granted among the Norwegian participants, not anything to fight for. In another study, not of youth, but of older people, we again analyzed the Norwegian social context 
characterized by a more strong individualism today compared to when these older people grew up. To get information oh, about me versus rethinking, uh, we did not, naturally, <coughs> you will understand that, we did not ask them about their future. They were rather old, these sad and old elder people. But uh, <coughs> we asked them about we versus me thinking in another way. We asked them about their sense of community. Macmillan or Chavez defined sense of community as people having a feeling of belongingness. They believe that they can exert some control of the group and also be influenced by the group. They believe that their needs can be and are being met through the collective capabilities of the group. And because of a shared history, they feel a very strong emotional bonding and investment in the group. That is the concept, sense of community, used very much in today's research. Among other things, old people from the city of Oslo got the following <coughs> question. What meaning um, <clears throat> do you relate to the concept, sense of community? And in which way would you say sense of community is important to you as an elderly person. As a positive psychologist, I see the qualities of sense of community as vital to individual and societal well-being. The absence of belonging may imply loneliness, depression, aggression, and unhappiness. Let me first say that the old Norwegian city influence meaning systems reflected Macmillan and Chavez conceptualization. However, even though living in a welfare society, public services, communality, communal, communal system of care were not mentioned by the old people. But the older people, <coughs> persons, revealed strong expectations over themselves and other community members to participate in their local communities and take responsibility for being part of community and thereby for old well-being. You have to participate, was the mantra. Thus, they emphasized individual responsibility. For example, a female age 85 said, you are solely responsible both for your health and your own life. A 78 years old man said, yes, to participate is important in old age and to be involved in order to, to be included and continue in community. There is one thing I am afraid of and that is dementia. And I have found and I have found out that I have to be involved to stay healthy. Another 85 years old female said, yes, I believe that sense of community is important for well-being. If you only sit at home, do nothing, do not get out, contribute, meet people and things like that, then you cannot experience. We have also compared the older Norwegians' discourses about sense of community with the discourses of <clears throat> old people in the city of Mumbai in India. The Indian sample was also, also as the Oslo sample, <coughs> concerned very much with own sense of community. But they were more specifically related, <coughs> they more specifically related sense of community to <clears throat> the explicit worrying about changing 
a changing social system in India, the family system. They felt that changing of the family system affected their sense of community, their belongings and their fulfillment of needs. As an 81 year old person formulated this changing situation in India, as I told you, most of them come to old age home because of family problems. Earlier, India was famous for group family living. It is no more. But <clears throat> the elderly tried to adapt and anticipated new changes in society and community. As an 82 years old woman said, community development has to take place. And everyone who can help, they should pull out their resources, their energy, time, money, and make a community worthwhile living. Today, globalizing processes integrate and connect societies and organizations all over the world. An increasing amount of us live in cultures of hybridity, struggling to manage cultural diversity and cultural and societal changes. And governments all over the world are today also struggling with finding solutions to how people can get along well with people from different cultures. Societies and social actors use symbolic boundaries or conceptual distinctions to categorize people, social practices, and objects. Some social categorizations are including and accepting, whereas others are harshly excluding, and they all have strong influences on our daily life. Positive interdependence, my central word, which I started with, positive interdependence is about living together also in a peaceful, respectful, and accepting way. Back also to language. Language and concepts can recognize or not recognize communal values, accept, respect, and care. In another study from my research group, we have analyzed changes in symbolic boundaries between the majority and immigrant minority groups in the Norwegian society over a period of 25 years starting in 1984. Since the late 60s, Norway has been gradually trans transformed from a relative homogeneous to an increasingly multicultural society. Again, we use media language as our empirical data. Our question to the Norwegian society and language then was, do symbolic boundary markers over time function mostly including or excluding? During the more than 25 years period <clears throat> we analyzed, there was in the language of the public discourse a shift from general boundaries of otherness to an increasing amount of more specified boundaries of origin, visibility, and immigrant otherness. Even the majority was no ascribe its own symbolic label to mark a boundary towards all others in that the term ethnic Norwegian was introduced. New word in a period. Let it be said, all human interaction are dialogical, 
we presume otherness, and the other is always incorporated to some degree in the self, and vice versa. Societies and also boundaries and social categories are always changing. As a positive psychologist, working with maker level interventions, creating and recreating more open social categories are, as I see it, one way of reducing conflicts in society. Whatever categories and boundaries a society starts with and use, it is extremely important to keep in mind that categories and boundaries are unstable, historical, emergent, and indeterminate. These categories are possible to change and develop into more positive human concepts of openness, accept and respect. The philosopher Heidegger, known for his existential and phenomenological explorations of the question of being, has argued that Western philosophy has ignored this most important aspect of human existence, the lived experience of our existence. I could say the same about psychology. But all of us here are professionals. We have to remember all people, also oneself. We are being situated in particular context, times, and life words, and therefore, our view of reality and good life is necessarily shaped by the time and place we live in. As positive psychologists, then, we have to keep in mind, in the research as well as in practice, this essential point that each individual is born into historical, cultural, and physiological situated ecology, entailing, as we have seen, particular worldviews, meaning systems, or ideologies of human survival, growth, flourishing, and well-being. Ideologists and value systems provide us with complex ideas, thought, and feeling systems not only about how to develop and live as an individual, but also about organizing community, collective arrangement, safety nets for us if we need it, and so on. Thereby, ideologies have huge influences about individual life and social structures. Sometimes, sometimes, we are happy, we are lucky. Sometimes <clears throat> society create ideologies which forcefully facilitate the actualization and realization of our natural positive capacities, <coughs> virtues and characteristics and open up for holding positive expectation about and hopes for the future. Sometimes, however, society's ideologies and practices are gross inhibiting for positive interdependence for groups and society. Positive psychologist has, as I see it, a mandate to study and know this ecology as we have a mandate to improve the well-being both of society and the individual. And of course, as you know, had said, said, these two levels are strongly interweaved. 
Can I almost uh, be a new person now? I have been now presenting uh, <clears throat> research from the Oslo Ideology Project. Now, uh, have I a few more minutes at all? Good. Uh, <clears throat> then I also can present the old black eye. Uh, because, no, I will only for a few minutes. This was my life very much as a researcher. This is the group's project for a long period. Let it finally be mentioned that together with Professor Rolf Blocker, I have been for almost two decades been involved in a rehabilitation program for young offenders, primarily used with multicultural background and we have been using the principle of positive psychology. The aim of these uh, interventions for young offenders has been to build networks of relations between young offenders and the local environment, trying to emotionally support, actively help them with mastering skills and understandings of values in the environment they are likely to come back to. We are trying effectively and practically to support their hopes and plans for the future, naturally, not unlike that of other years, ethnic, Norwegian or not. Let me also mention that it has been mandatory for our master students in community psychology to work a semester in this rehabilitation program based on positive psychologist approach of positive relationship, meaning and purpose, kindness and citizenship, to mention a few of our aims. And important, the program has over time showed better results and less relapse into crime than other programs. And I will also say that the program has been uh, economically funded by two Norwegian ministries, the Ministry of Law and the Ministry of Family Affairs, together with the city of Oslo. In fact, the Ministry of Law uh, came to us and said, oh, we have heard about um, <clears throat> uh, some of your research as a positive psychologist. I think it is very central. If you could uh, <clears throat> use time <clears throat> and try to build and rebuild, revitalize new intervention for young offenders. And I have, in this uh, <clears throat> work, been together, together with uh, Rob. Have I two more minutes? You have two more minutes. Uh, and uh, uh, you know, maybe some, that uh, my group has represented Norway in Antonella del Favre's huge multinational project, the Eudaimonic and Hedonic Happiness Investigation. A project uh, I suppose many of you know. And it has been um, so interesting, of course, as a research so, to be in the project that Antonella with all my heart, it is such a pleasure to work with Antonella. So thank you, Antonella. <laughs>
Uh, what Professor Nastad uh, illustrated uh, uh, is a huge amount of work, uh, ranging from uh, investigating uh, uh, the use of uh, language uh, to point uh, to social, uh, to individualistic uh, or collectivistic uh, values, from uh, the work uh, and the application of positive psychology with uh, young offenders, from the perception uh, of uh, sense of community among uh, young people and old people in different cultures. So, so much is uh, the, uh, the material, the food for thought that she has proposed us, that probably it is, uh, it could raise so many questions that may be difficult to focus on just in a few minutes, but uh, of course, uh, uh, not a question, but a comment. You have got a handout, and in that handout you will find references to articles addressing most of the issues in the lecture hall. So you can then in the select the articles you're interested in. You will see that things will come. Such a lecture might be overwhelming. Any question? And I know, um, as a psychologist, uh, you may think that it is a rather strange way to start with society, because normally psychology starts with the individual. I have always thought, why do not psychology do the opposite sometimes, and decided to start the Oslo ideology project. So don't, as working at, uh, as a practical, don't forget the environment of your clients. It is important. The meaning systems of the clients. Yes. Um, I think uh, if I can make a, a yes. general comment on what Hilde said, uh, this is uh, actually an issue, in my opinion, in psychology, and especially in positive psychology. Because uh, although we are, for example, doing, uh, and there is an increasing amount uh, of studies, uh, for example, in uh, cross-cultural studies, very often uh, these studies just compare, I mean, this issue of society remains on the surface or in the background. Mm. We just use two cultures to show how people are different in different parts of the world, though they are the same. But uh, we never really look deeper into the social dimension, which is not just collectivism versus individualism to the host and the categories. Mm. It is also not simply, simply the Inglehart Betzel's map of uh, how do people uh, include the transcendent values or uh, conf conformity values and so on. It's more, it is what's happening, exactly what you said, what is happening in daily life. What is the experience of people in social context, mm. in the family dimension, in the work context, uh, in the socializing context. And this is really something, this is a gap. In, uh, in positive psychology studies. Uh, in, uh, let's say, mainstream psychology, this is the topic addressed usually by social psychologists, but still, uh, this is uh, something that should be addressed more in terms of values and in terms of experiences. And I think this is very important to be. And I have to done. say, uh, oh, sorry, I interrupted. Uh, one of our one of the founders of positive psychology, Martin Seligman, he took a rather rational choice. I thought, think he, he did it wrong. He said, oh, it is much easier to change the person and not society, and therefore uh, we can almost drop the societal level. We can't um, change Norway, we can't change America, and I think this is not the way for positive psychology to go. It may be sometimes easier to change a society. To explicate the values, make public discourses. You can't think 
that one person, heavily, for example, suffering, shall <clears throat> bear the burdens of changing a community, a group, or a society. Yes. So, happily, I would say happily, we can uh, disagree within <clears throat> um, positive psychology, and I totally and agree with Seligman's point there. Don't trust that point, I would say. Think about every time, for example, when you have a, a client, think about his or her ecology. Yes. Mm. was by you what you said Antonella in, in mainstream psychology we have social psychology I myself used to be a social psychologist the problem with social psychology there are two variants of social psychology the one the, the, the dominant one is the North American very individual this is social psychology individual the small group social psychology there is another variant of social psychology which is totally neglected in the North America and that involves neglected in the world. That is the European variant where you have societal social yes. psychology and that's the, the variant of social psychology that we are interested in. But this variant has not been accepted. So if you read a textbook in social psychology today, you find little about society, a lot about small groups with two, three, four, or five individuals. And to be ideological, you can't help people without knowing society. And societies are always also changing. So you, uh, within positive psychology, we should always have what I call parameters of change, giving back to practitioners what are the situation. For example, this decade or so. Yeah. I was I, very ideological now. Thank you. And actually, um, many, many, many points of your view is um, very connected to what I've been uh, doing in the past years, and it's about uh, social representations theory. I don't know if you have heard about that. Because social identity theory? Social representations social theory. Social representations. Yes, yes, because, yes, Moscow. Yes, yes, yes. So for. Yeah, uh, yeah. He, he died two years ago, but uh, I think he's, uh, because uh, with, together with social identity theory, these are the, um, uh, the European social psychology spirit, and it's very different from the, the, individu uh, the, the North American individualistic uh, perspective. And it's putting more social dimension on social psychology. So, um, uh, I think it's really interesting uh, to, to link from the uh, not only bottom-up but also top-down system yes. uh, ideology which is um, from the sociological point and social science and uh, then uh, communication language because they are all connected and the, the, the problem for yes the problem for individual psychology also uh, it has been the background also for, uh, of the um, positive psychology because it the idea may comes from North uh, America but I think it's uh, it's more the the approach um, of seeing seeing things in a positive way and focusing on more how to improve the society how to uh, use psychological knowledge to 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 um, improve uh, in general from the not only individual level but also uh, institutional organizational society level. So I think it's a, a very good point of view 
to broaden our mind, not only focus from the individualistic, experimental, comparing minor differences, because there are so many um, like in deep differences, cultural differences behind uh, the the phenomena of some 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 results. So and uh, I, I was uh, sorry. Um, so when I was reading the references, there is also like lay understanding of happiness across nations, which I just remind me of some I what I did some years ago. But I, well, at that time I did really know so much about social representations theory, but uh, I was also thinking about how differently we, just the concept of like well-being, happiness, there are so many differences uh, even uh, behind the, the concept. So yeah, thank you, thank you for your speech. <laughs> and I totally agree with you. Um, <clears throat> just a small question on the, um, these last points uh, about the difference between uh, <coughs> um, American uh, individualist social psychologists and this approach to social psychology. Um, I wanted to ask, what, is, uh, uh, what do you think may be the difference then between uh, uh, this specific uh, approach to uh, cultural studies, uh, studies of value uh, from social psychology and the approach of uh, cultural anthropology? Sometimes, I would say almost similar. Sorry? Sometimes I would say they are almost similar from social anthropology and from <clears throat> the positions I have presented here. Okay. But uh, most, uh, even for example in Norway, uh, we are always collaborating with anthropology. But uh, Rob, do you think we have one uh, reference there? Uh, I think there, in Norway, I would say we are collaborating. Uh, but of course, in the end, psychology is more interested in the individual. The level is different. The, the, the two last questions are very interesting on the background. I could have given a long lecture on they, they, they carries out whole... And he is happily now. Hmm? You are happily now, so now I sit down. The yes, wife. I'm happily. Yeah, I'm looking for those two last questions. Uh, because the, 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 the particular, uh, the one about Moscovici, uh, and let me try to answer, since we are on our, our time, let me try to answer very short, briefly with a short history, which is very true. In Copenhagen, when was it, uh, uh, Antonella? 2010. 2010. Uh, I ha had dinner together with two of the most famous American social psychologists, really you know, much better social psychologists than me in the literature. Then I told them about Moscovici. They said, who is Moscovici? Who is Moscovici? And that's two very famous American social psychologists. This tells us a lot about what is the problem to our discipline. There is a there is a lack of communication. Europe is lucky because we have language problems, we have cultural problems. We, we have to try to communicate. Americans are really unlucky. They have a language that everybody masters. They don't have to think about these things. They can take their own assumptions for granted. We have to question our assumptions all the time, like Moscovici did. He was a fantastic person. Other questions? So I would like also to 
make a small conclusion uh, concerning uh, the, 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 the international project Hilda mentioned before, uh, the eudaimonic and hedonic happiness inventory about definitions of happiness. What we found around, uh, across countries, and uh, we worked on language actually, because we worked uh, on definitions of happiness provided by people. We found that uh, most people, regardless of their country, in their lived experience, daily experience, describe happiness in a very similar way. Even uh, the supposedly very individualistic Americans, the lay people, the people we meet in the street, they are not really reflected. This does not really reflect what we would expect from an American. I mean, uh, the, the basic uh, findings we got is that at a psychological level, for example, even the Americans, uh, where we have the core studies on happiness as very positive emotion uh, or satisfaction with achievements and so on, lay people say that happiness is inner harmony and inner balance. This is true for Americans, this is true for Indians, this is true for Norwegians and Italians and Croatians. So there is a common understanding of what is happiness uh, among lay people, these lay people who are completely neglected by researchers, because we cannot understand really uh, what do people think if we just ask them to put little crosses on a scale. And this is another issue we are facing in psychology, uh, because scales are grounded into ideology assumptions that the scales uh, represent uh, a construct. And people can only say yes, no, how much. We need uh, to study constructs anew, to go back uh, to the true psychological research, which is qualitative. In order to understand constructs, we must question ourselves. What does this word mean? Because uh, in this way, we must work more on the grounds uh, of uh, our discipline, because otherwise uh, we risk uh, to take for granted some constructs that are not reflected by the lay people. And if psychology is there to study people, then we should start from lay people ideologies, lay people view of uh, the reality. So thank you very much for this important contribution, because I think this opens uh, new ways uh, uh, and uh, new approaches that uh, actually they are not you, new, they are forgotten yeah, in our discipline. Yes and yes ago. Uh, thank you very much. <laughs>